So uh, let's start with Julia Abersole. Julia, come on out. Julia is uh, my colleague, actually, at the University of Louisville. She is um, uh, the manager of the 10,000 square foot clean room that we have on campus, and we, we would love to have you guys come down to campus and see some of the things that we have going on. So let's give Julia a quick round of applause. <laughs> Julia is also wicked awesome on a dirt bike. So um, <laughs> uh, let's bring in Twyman Clements. Twyman is uh, president and CEO of Space Tango. It's a Lexington-based company focused on utilizing space for solutions on Earth. So let's hear it for Twyman. All right, Twyman's got some fans up there. And then we've got Jay Galantine. Jay, come on out. Jay is an author and space historian. Uh, he's focused primarily on... Uh, unmanned planetary, uh, planetary exploration, and um, he's, he's got a couple of books out, Ambassadors from Earth, and his, his uh, next book, Infinity Beckon. Uh, so look for those as well. Let's hear it for Jay. Then we've got Chris Kimmel. Sorry, I'm still going in alphabetical order. <laughs> Uh, Chris is president and founder of Kentucky Science Technology Corporation, and Chris is going to kind of serve as the moderator for, for the session today after I stop talking. <laughs> so let's hear it for Chris. <laughs> and then finally, we have Michelle Lucas. Uh, Michelle is uh, founder and president of Higher Orbits, which is a nonprofit enterprise with a mission to utilize space to launch student interest in STEM uh, fields. And uh, she has a long uh, track record in history. Well, not, I guess not that long, because she's not that old. But oh, a long uh, track record at <laughs> NASA's it. Johnson Space Center. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over. Let's hear it for Michelle. With that, I'll turn it over to Chris and you, uh, enjoy the session. Thank First you. First of all, let me thank the panel. We have an amazing group of people here um, from uh, this, and it's, it's the space industry and, and related industries. And I want to really thank everyone for coming. They have all uh, earned their stripes in, in really creative ways. Um, so what we want to do this morning is just talk, you know, a, a little bit about um, this, what we call next generation space. And, and some of you may be familiar, maybe some of you aren't, because a lot of times the only news we get is, you know, some of the, either the failures or, you know, huge events that are going on, like water on the Mars, water on the Mars like water on the knee, uh, water on Mars, which we'll talk about. Um, but there really is a revolution going on right now in space exploration, and particularly in uh, the, one of the major parts of it, which is commercial space exploration. Uh, and that's being brought about by a lot of things. One of it is the rapid uh, miniaturization of, and rapid and acceleration of miniaturization of new technologies. For the first time, we're really able to build incredibly small, uh, reasonably cost, but incredibly high value uh, space platforms and technology. And that includes both um, small satellites, um, which we'll talk about, which Space Tango and Kentucky Space, and I'll get more into that, uh, do, uh, particularly with Moorhead State University and the University of Kentucky, and we've also done work with the University of Louisville, in, in building very, very small orbital spacecraft uh, that fit in the palm of your hand, literally. Uh, in fact, we've also built, assisted in building spacecraft that are not much larger than your cell phone, and which we launched uh, about a year and a half ago out of Yasny, Russia. And to our knowledge, those spacecraft um, called pocket cube class satellites uh, are the smallest orbital spacecraft ever put into orbit that successfully worked. Uh, and, and they were designed and built here. Uh, and, and then secondly, um, access to space um, with the retirement of the shuttle, which you know a lot of people had legitimate misgivings about, and I was one that was concerned about that, has really, has really, in fact, energized the entrepreneurial space marketplace. Uh, it has led to companies like SpaceX, uh, Blue Origins, and, and, and the um, uh, more, more entrepreneurial kind of direct um, pace of Orbital and other companies. Um, and they have filled that void with an entrepreneurial private sector spirit that has dramatically, is dramatically increasing the access to space, the ability to get into orbit and beyond uh, in partnership with NASA. And I give NASA a lot of credit uh, for the leadership and willing to get out of the box to uh, execute a very different different style and, and process. Uh, and also, 
Um, another big thing that's happening is through technology is and is the incredible automation that is now possible for exploration, which we'll talk about, and the incredible new astronomical tools uh, uh, that are allowing us to see planets, to see things in space, uh, in visible space that uh, we couldn't have imagined um, 5, 10, 15 years ago and are leading to um, all sorts of different kinds of discoveries and insights. So having that, I'm going to ask everybody just really quickly just to tell you, tell everybody how they kind of fit in the picture and then we'll go away. Let me start with Michelle. Yeah, and uh, yeah, okay. and like I said, Michelle, among other things, she'll tell you, but Michelle actually trained um, astronauts for a decade. Is that correct? About uh, a decade? Yeah, just okay. about. All right, so Michelle. So I'm a certified space dork as far as I'm concerned. I've been in love with space since I was about three. I had the great privilege and honor of working at Johnson Space Center in mission control for the International Space Station and then went on to train astronauts, flight controllers, and instructors on International Space Station systems, not just in the U.S., but in Russia, Europe, and Japan. Uh, I got a little crazy, as my mom would tell you, and I decided to toss the regular paycheck out the door and uh, started a nonprofit called Higher Orbits because I found that there was a new pathway that I had found a passion for, and that's using space as a vehicle to excite students about STEM. Not trying to turn everybody into a rocket scientist, but let's face it, how many of you are excited about the fact that there's water on Mars? All right, thank you. Things like this are the kinds of things that everybody can get behind. Admittedly, I was not around for the day we landed on the moon, and I sure wish I was, because I think that that was a great energizing function for our country and for the world. And I think space in general can be a great energizing function for our students. The fact that there are companies like Space Tango out there giving access to student experiments in space, it's revolutionary. Can you imagine, all of you right there, how would you feel <laughs> if your experiment was actually in space. Yeah, you're like, yeah, okay, that might be okay. That might be kind of cool. All right, it's eight o'clock. I'll, yeah. I'll give you a free pass but, but on that But when it's one. there, it's something different. Um, yeah. Let me ask you, how about if it could text you from space? <laughs> there, there you are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I grew up as the kid who went to space camp and loved every minute of it, and I'm still highly involved with space camp, but the idea of it launching something of mine into space, forget about it. That was so beyond the realm of possibilities. But with the commercialization of space and companies like Space Tango, that's very real and very possible. And so I run camps that allow students to do exactly that. And if that doesn't get kids excited about STEM, I, I really don't know what else to do. <laughs> because that pretty much putting your own experiment into space it's pretty, uh, pretty out of this world, and I'm going to totally be cheesy like that because that's the best I got at 815. So. <laughs> Jay? Well, I think what I really bring to this panel here is the historical perspective. I've, I've always been a space geek. I've always been a, just a huge history buff, uh, and it's been a lot of fun to go um, porpoising through the histories of these different uh, missions and whatnot. A lot of people wonder why we're doing the things that we're doing right now, why are we just following the water on Mars? Why aren't we actually testing for life on Mars? And it's because we tested for life in 1976, if anybody can remember that. And there were all kinds of problems. And ever since then, we've all been arguing about what exactly has been found and whatnot. Um, so I think that's what I can offer here is, why are we doing it this way? Why are we going in this particular path? Why are certain things happening now? Because I understand the, the groundwork and the, the paths that have been laid to get us here. Twyman? Um, my name is Twyman Clements, and uh, I work with uh, kind of two organizations, Kentucky Space, uh, which is a nonprofit umbrella organization in the state that works with uh, several, um, that's run out of KSTC, which does Idea Festival, um, works with several universities and has built spacecraft uh, equipment on the International Space Station and actually done, um, which Chris will talk about, some what we call exomedicine work, which is, which is how, um, how space or microgravity affects uh, disease processes, uh, living systems, and, and, and that whole uh, uh, realm of, uh, of things. And then I work uh, with a company called Space Tango. Uh, I am the serve as the CEO of that. We're a startup based out of Lexington, and we have some equipment um, installations being installed in the International Space Station early next year uh, that will host experiments like what Michelle talked about um, and, and commercial experiments in, in the pharmaceutics and material sciences fields. And what will happen is once those are plugged in, again, using the students as that example, um, once it's plugged in, once the astronauts plug those experiments in, they're internet connected, you log on uh, through, our, through our web portal and you'll be able to control, get your data down, 
um, in, in near real time. And it kind of eliminates a lot of the barriers that a lot of people think of. And um, I started as a student uh, building a satellite. We've built a couple and, and, and taken it from there. And I'm as well a, a huge space nerd, uh, but mine uh, really didn't get into Star Trek or Star Wars or anything, but I saw Apollo 13 when I was a kid. And I was like, you know, wait, we did that? So, and then a kid, that was 25. Yeah. <laughs> I know, like, <laughs> it's not fair. Julia? You're making me feel old. Oh, sorry. It's yeah. making us all feel old. Yeah. It's time for your nap, too. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, that's fine. Get your bottle out. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks again for coming down. Uh, my name is uh, Julia Abershold. I am the manager of the Micro Nanotechnology Center uh, at the University of Louisville. Um, it is a 10,000 square foot, class 100, class 1,000 clean room facility. And what a lot of people don't know is it's actually a top 10 facility if you look at uh, academic clean rooms across the, across the country. So the state has made a great investment, and our specialty is making things small. So this is actually a great relationship that we have with Space Tango and also Kentucky Space, but also with Moorhead State University, into where they are able to, they're very good at putting things in space, but they may need our help as far as like making very small sensors and devices or putting down an exotic type of coating that can withstand the harsh environment of space as far as the radiation or even going to the extent of helping, uh, say, uh, Exomedicine Institute mm -hmm. uh, and also Space Tango in putting experiments onto the ISS. Yep. Well, let me just introduce Dr. Neal, who's in the audience, who's with Moorhead, who's the dean, who's the Space Science Center uh, at Moorhead State University is under him. And unfortunately, Ben Malfors couldn't be here. He's in Paris or... I don't know, somewhere, the Cayman Islands or something, giving a talk. Um, he always but, uh, but it's an, it's an amazing facility. We work very closely with them on a lot of areas. And also Dr. Mahendra James in the back. Uh, uh, Mahendra is also uh, the space, uh, really the science um, advisor. Um, Ed's kind of Spock. He's like our chief science officer um, from India uh, for, for Space Tango and Kentucky Space. Um, so let me, let me just, again, back up a little bit and put some of this in, in context. We've been throwing around a lot of organizations, and we're really, also we're really excited to be working with all of these people um, on the panel on the things that we do. Uh, Kentucky, just to bring it back home a little bit, Kentucky, for some of you, how many of you have heard of actually of Kentucky Space in some way? Okay, actually, Yay. maybe about a half of the audience. There's actually three <laughs> companies now in Kentucky that work in the entrepreneurial space marketplace, which most people don't, many people don't realize. One is Kentucky Space which was created in 2006. Uh, Kentucky Science Technology Corporation, which is many of you know an independent nonprofit company, um, is the parent company. But these are all three independent subsidiaries. They truly really are subsidiaries. Kentucky Space is a nonprofit um, uh, company. It's really the R&D arm of our space activities, uh, working with Moorhead and, and others, or UK, UVL. We build, design, develop um, space technology, space platforms, um, satellites, and technology for station. Um, the second company is um, Space Tango. Space Tango is a for-profit company. Um, Twyman is the CEO of that. Do you know what it's like working with a bunch of people like Twyman, who's 28, and he's the senior member of his team. Everybody on his team is like Youngster. 24, 25, and their frame, of your, their frame of reference ends about 1990. <laughs> you, you know how hard it is? You go, hey, you know this movie? And they're like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, so anyway, um, so we have that. And then let me talk about, uh, um, Chris, can you bring up that slide? So the third company. Um, the third company actually grew out of our work with Kentucky Space and our work on the International Space Station. And, and the third company really deals with this question. What if the next medical breakthrough isn't on the planet Earth? And let me just also say that um, this is our tagline. This was actually, NASA actually asked us at the International Space um, the, the International Conference this summer in Boston for the International Space Station attended by about 700 people from around the world. Um, if they could use this tagline, if they could actually have an astronaut on station use this tagline to open up the, one of the sessions at the conference and we actually gave them permission. Does so anybody have, of course, Twyman, he kind of, you know, he, in his talk he kind of addressed it, but anybody have a real sense of what this is referring to? You want to hazard a guess? There's really no wrong answer. Actually there is, Ron. Any of the students, do you, no you want to hazard a guess what this we, we're talking about here? 
Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> it's early. It's early. Um, well, basically, fundamentally, one of the things that we discovered as we were working on, I don't want to discover, but maybe uncovered or um, illustrated, is we were working a lot in building technology for space station and other kinds of things and working with a lot of people, is we suddenly understood that actually we have a very poor understanding, very little understanding of how living systems and particularly disease processes operate outside the gravity well. Um, most of the work that's been done in medical science and space, um, and there's been a lot of work done. We're not, we didn't say we started that. It's been done on astronaut health, which is, which is, is, is you know, certainly very important. We can learn a lot from that. Um, but exomedicine really, as we define it, deals with the research development and commercialization of medical solutions in the microgravity environment of space for applications on Earth. So what we do and what we have started to do and what we now do um, really quite heavily and led to the creation of a third in nonprofit company, which is the Exomedicine Medicine Institute, is that we now use the technology, we design a lot of the technology that we develop for ourselves and for others to do some pretty, um, we think, some pretty novel experiments in space in exomedicine. Uh, we're looking at things, you know, basically we're trying to understand, and we understand this is just the beginning, this is indeed a new frontier in, space, in, a new frontier in medicine. One of the first members of our science advisory team was a Dr. Baruch Bloomberg, who was a Nobel Prize winner, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering the hepatitis B virus and then the vaccine. Uh, he was a member of our original four-person team, helped us put together several papers on exomedicine, and was really the spark that kind of validated this, this notion that we had, this hypothesis, that there were medical breakthroughs to be found in microgravity that would save people's lives. And why is that? Well, the reason is, well, obviously, when you leave the earth, as, as Dr. Bloomberg and I discussed and he mentioned, there are four forces in nature. There's the, there's the strong force, the weak force, electromagnetism, and gravity. So when you extract gravity out of the equation, you're basically extracting 25%, a fourth of, of the forces that impact us all. And when you do that, when you leave the gravity well, all your assumptions, all your notions about how things operate go out the window. You get a complete scrambling of all the physical and biological processes uh, in space that in, many, in most cases, um, in all cases probably, you would not see on Earth. And what that does is, we think, it gives us new ideas, new understandings, uh, uh, doors opening up into new kinds of things that are possible within that the organism, molecule, what have you, that we would not see on Earth. It gives us different kinds of ways of looking at that uh, for different kinds of, of approaches to that. Secondly, we believe very strongly that we will be very soon, um, at least our, our hypothesis, bioengineering products in space that will be applied on Earth. So we'll basically have products based in space, uh, originated in space, that will be treating different kinds of, of disorders, diseases, pharmaceuticals, what have you on Earth. Uh, and the third, which is a little bit more down the road, but you know, we've talked about it a lot, is even the potential someday of people actually being transported to low Earth orbit for treatment because the systemic changes are so great that you might get resolutions in space because of the changes in the cells and the molecules and other kinds of things that you wouldn't see on Earth. So that's what exomedicine is. Um, we actually have, um, we're doing a very big, we've done a, a series of experiments. We've probably flown a half dozen to space station already um, with um, University of Rome, Warhead State University. Um, we've got a big project we're doing now with Tufts University on regenerative medicine. We're working with a team in Ireland on cystic fibrosis. Um, and um, we're doing a second regenerative medicine. We're looking at cancer cells, uh, really a number of things. And of course, again, it's very, very early, so we're not making any, any huge claims at this point. But we do, we absolutely are now convinced after three years of talking to people all around the world uh, in great science areas that this, this is indeed a new frontier in medicine. So that's what we're doing. And then on the other side, we've, um, with Space Tango, we also not just are building, you know, we have a laboratory actually going up in now, we thought it was going to be January, probably March, SpaceX 9, uh, that Twyman and his team have designed, which is a, a laboratory for space station that will give us real estate on station that allows us to do, and our partners, anywhere from 15 to 20, 30 experiments simultaneously. And the next lab, which is we call Space uh, Tango Lab 2, that's Tango Lab 1, which is one Julia's been working a lot, would be working a lot with us on, is a factor of probably 15 to 20 better than the Tango Lab 1, and it will allow us to do, using microfluidic and lab-on-chip technology, somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand experiments um, simultaneously in space um, that will allow us to do, and also, Prime will tell you a little bit more how that, how that works. So I just wanted to give you that context of where Kentucky fits into this. Um, 
Uh, there's a huge space science center at Moorhead. We're actually getting ready to or, or open a space design center in Lexington, which you all will be invited to when we open it in about a month, where we're going to consolidate all of our engineering design systems as well as some of the biological, uh, have a small biological lab. But again, we work with a lot of different people. We work with um, uh, Michelle as a major part of our team in a lot of areas, not just in higher orbits, but her brain. Uh, and, and there's a lot of other people that we, we, um, you know, we work with in trying to uncover um, some of these secrets and, and new pathways. So that's the context. But let, so let me go back uh, and talk a little bit about, I want to talk a little bit about um, Twyman. Just tell, me, tell us a little bit more about the lab itself and why that's going to be, why that's better than what's up there now and why it's, what it's going to be able to do, because it's not just biology, it's also materials. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, essentially what it does is it enables what, what we tell our customers is you're, I mean, yes, you're going to space, but you're really what our customers are is they're capitalizing on a unique physics environment, which is a lack of gravity. And, um, of course, astronauts' time, as, as uh, Michelle will, will tell, probably tell here in a second, we budgeted about $35,000 an hour. Now, we, that's not a direct payment in any way, but it takes a lot of time um, as a customer to, to do planning and, you know, you have to do that months uh, out. So what we do is we try to automate as much as possible. And, um, and <clears throat> what, what we've been able to do working with NASA is get uh, essentially um, to, uh, no real fancy name for it, but essentially an internet, uh, an internet connection of each individual experiment. We can hold about between 20 and 25 at a time and um, you know, working with open source softwares and some other things, have that data stream continuously. And so again, through that web portal, you can, you can um, see something. And uh, two, cool, or two examples I give people of why that's important or what the uniqueness is, is one, um, uh, because there's no gravity, there's no con convective heat flow. And basically what that means is, as we all know, hot air rises and then cold air comes in under it. So uh, if you've ever seen the comparison of a flame in space and a flame on, or a flame on, on the Earth and a flame in space, the flame in space is a bulb and it's dark blue. Because what happens is the hot air doesn't rise, it just stays there and it creates a bulb uh, of hot air around it so that it's oxygen deprived. So if you have electronics or anything else creating heat, if you have no air moving across it, it will, it'll fry the electronics. And, and so it's, it's one of those non-intuitive things. And, and one thing that actually happens to the astronauts that I, I like to tell people is, um, you know, if we're, we're sitting here on Earth or standing up, the pressure in your legs is higher than the pressure in your head. But when you go to space, that equalizes and incre increases the, the, the pressure in your head and actually squeezes their eyeballs. And uh, they, are they nearsighted or farsighted? I can't remember. They're one or the other. Um, and and it, what, what, they have to come back down for that to equalize. So um, it essentially, what the lab does is allow people to capitalize on, on, on uh, that unique environment. Michelle, why, I mean, why, um, I mean, I know you say, you know, it, it, I mean, STEM is, is, is important, but I think, you know, obviously we've talked about, it. it's also about, you know, in this new revolution in space, you know, it's about preparing just the next, you know, talent force that's gonna have to do all this stuff. Oh, absolutely. And the beauty of working with students in the space environment is that all of us, even Twyman, who's you know the young pup of the group, uh, we're a little more formed in our ideas. We have these barriers up of, well, this is how it was done before. And students are perhaps the best one to answer the, what if the next medical breakthrough isn't on planet Earth? What should we be looking at? What should we be studying? And so, the next, right now, about 560 people have been to space. It's not a huge number, but it's, you know, it's, it's not too bad. I suspect in the next 10 years, that number is going to at least double, if not triple, depending on, you know, how commercial space plays out. But with every commercial entity that's working in space, the options for jobs that directly correlate to space also double and triple. And the options for medical breakthroughs, material breakthroughs in space, it, it, the possibilities become infinite. So we need to not just prepare our students to be thinking about engineering here on Earth or science here on Earth. We need to start get them thinking out of the box or literally off the planet of how can I improve life on Earth through whatever's happening in space. Julie, why is, why, I mean, working with Twyme and, um, Mm -hmm. Tell us what you, a little bit more about the incredible level of sophistication in these very, 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 very small nano devices that you think about and work on. 
Um, that's actually a good question. Um, in, in our particular lab, well, you know, our name pretty much says the scale that we deal with. We're in micro and nanotechnology. So to give you an idea, so we typically work in like microns. Uh, to give you an idea of what, one, uh, what a micron is like, a typical human hair is anywhere from 75 to 100 microns in width. So we are dealing with very, very small devices. As what um, Twyman talked about earlier, uh, you know, it, not just astronaut time, but also the expense to get things into space is is very expensive. What is it like a hundred thousand dollars per kilogram or something like that? Yeah, it yeah. varies. Yeah, it, but it's, it's, it's not up there. Cheap. You know, it's yeah, just no. pocket change, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, basically, with our specialty and the ability to make things small, especially on the micron level, especially like in the area of microfluidics and so forth, is that. Number one, we can make things, uh, when we make things very small, we can increase the number of experiments that Twine was talking about. One of the items that has happened uh, historically in the past on the, uh, on the ISS in particular is that when you do experiments on, on station and so forth, you have a limited, limited number of data set. Um, with what ExoMedicine and what Space Tangle are doing is they're going to, uh, in combination with micro and nanotechnology, what we can produce, is that we can make the experiments very, very small, but then you could start to really ramp up the number of experiments that you can do, that you have. So if you start then thinking of this enormous data set and the number of variables that you can test, it just really, and especially if you can do it autonomously mm -hmm. uh, and communicate from the ground and so forth, you really can then capitalize on the time and also help keep your expense down as well as far as putting things into space. So, and, Another area that we're very excited about is uh, not just working in micro nanotechnology, which is a lot of is adopting a lot of techniques that um, we can use that is used in the semiconductor industry. Okay, we uh, like to make computer chips, but we can also make physical devices. And another area that we're very heavily focusing on now is also including 3D printing along with making sensors and putting those two together to make, like, for instance, the microfluidic devices. Jay, um, you know, big news last week. Yeah. We were on Mars. Um, before I get to that, talk, I mean, this, you know, I think a lot of people talk about, I think we all, I mean, I personally am I'm a huge believer in human exploration. Mm -hmm. um, people talk about, you know, when are we going to go back to exploring the heavens? But I also would argue that we already are. Um, through automation and robots and smart machines. And, and in mm -hmm. fact, some argue that will be the future of space exploration, um, the primer, just because of... So you want to talk a little bit about the history and what do you think yeah, about that? Yeah, I, I think you need both. I mean, all of my books have been about little robot machines exploring the solar system, but I, I really think you need both. So the, the robots are great for going out there and doing these, these missions that, that humans couldn't do. I mean, the Soviets, they, they landed a rover on the moon, and they drove the rover around for 11 months. And they stopped at every few meters and took measurements of the soil and took panoramic photographs. And that's a mission, and they ran it 24 hours a day, and, and that's a mission that humans just could not do. They have to sleep, they have to eat, all these different things. Same thing with going out to Jupiter. There's this incredible radiation environment out there, and we didn't know that until this little ship called Pioneer 10 got out there and explored it directly. It's an incredibly long voyage. It took years for the ship to get out there. So, so there's definitely a place for robots. Now, when it comes to humans, it's, there's a metric that someone finally established that, that a human could do in 15 minutes what it takes the, the Curiosity rover to do in a week. Wow. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and it's just how, you know, when you have someone who is out there, who is trained, has the eye, has the perspective. You know, when Harrison Schmidt was on the moon uh, during Apollo 17 in 1972, he's walking along, he's keeping to the flight plan, and all of a sudden, out of the corner of his eye, he sees orange soil on the surface of the moon, which otherwise is this big gray world of kitty litter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's something that, that the Soviet rover would never have noticed out of the corner of its eye. It's, it's something that any kind of advanced machine would not look at and automatically say, hey, that's important. And so I really think that there's, there's going to be a place for both. Sending 
humans is so much more expensive and the missions have to be so much more constrained. Uh, and then it's the other way with the, with the robots. So it's, it's going to be a mix, I think. Let me ask you something. And yeah. I mean, Michelle, both, because Michelle, you, you trained astronauts. Um, and we told, you know, we're talking about, you know, going to Mars, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, do we really at this point, I mean, do we, have we really figured out the issues technologically and even biomedically with radiation protection, all that, to even really at this point talk seriously about sending humans to Mars? The radiation is actually still our biggest issue. Being able yeah. to, and, and microtechnologies, nanotechnologies mm -hmm. are what we need because to adequately protect our crew between here and Mars from the radiation, the vehicle is going to have to be incredibly heavy um, or they're going to have massive health effects. So that is probably the biggest breakthrough we still need. The time and space, a little bit less of an issue. issue. We have gotten really good with our countermeasures. Our astronauts are spending six months in space. Scott Kelly and Gennady um, will spend a year. And we found good ways to make sure that their bones and muscles stay not quite as healthy as they would be here on Earth, but pretty darn close. So we've got that figured out, but the radiation is, is definitely what yeah. I would say is, is our limiting factor, and we're not quite there yet. Yeah, it's huge. Um, so um, big news, water on Mars. How many of you believe now that we've I think, that, you know, high confidence level, that's actually water, it's briny water, which is also good because yeah. it means it's not freezing, uh, much lower freeze point, which means life can, you know, is, is a better chance. How many of you actually think, now that we've actually found that water, it's obviously coming from underground, that there's life in that water of some primitive matter? Hmm? Yeah, what do you, what's the panel think? What do you think, what do you think, think so. the yeah. chances are? Give me a, give me a percentage. Percentage for yeah, me, yeah. I would actually say 100. percent Okay. And and I know that I'm in the minority. So, yeah, okay. the the Vikings <laughs> tested for life on Mars in in 76, as I mentioned earlier. It's it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. I mean, first people have to agree on what does it mean even to be alive, because you can say, well, for something to be alive, it has to consume, it has to excrete, it has to reproduce, and somebody else will jump in and say, well, fire meets that definition upon its face. And then all these other little sub-arguments precipitate and everything. Um, but when, when the life detection experiments were done in 1976, there was one experiment which I would call bulletproof. It was called labeled release. I can get into the details maybe after the panel is over. I'm happy to talk more about it. But, but it, was, it passed all of the pre-launch requisites, including the controls, for positively identifying life. Well, how come we're not all sitting here saying that there's life on the surface of Mars? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Viking was conducting this other experiment to look for organic compounds, carbon-based compounds on the surface of Mars, and it didn't find any. So in, in four tries at two different locations, it found zero organics. Also, at the time, the conventional wisdom was the, the pressure is too low, the, the temperatures are too low, there's no way that mm -hmm. there can be liquid water on the surface of Mars, Two of the three life detection experiments used liquids in the form of this, this food that they would drip onto the soil, a little bit of sugar, amino acids, vitamins, that kind of thing. And, and there were the naysayers saying, well, you know, you used an experiment that, that doesn't really apply to Mars because there can't be liquid water. Well, not only do we have water on Mars, but uh, just late last year, the Curiosity rover positively identified organics all over the surface of Mars, uh, primarily methane, but, but there's a lot of other complex organics too. And so these, these barriers to life have just continued to fall as time has gone on. Yeah. Um, obviously that would be incredibly exciting if there was, we verified that it is in fact water, which again, everybody thinks there is, and all sorts of, of amazing scientific implications if there's some sort of organic life or microbial life in that water, which is good. Um, but there's also, there's also a, another line of thought among some scientists that it may not be the best discovery for civilization on Earth called the Big Filter. Um, have you, are you familiar, anybody are you familiar with that, that line of reasoning? Let me, let me summarize it and then I'll ask everybody to comment. There are in fact a number of scientists, that um, um, reputable scientists, who have said, you know, they're not sure that that's, so, that's such a good good sign for, the, for uh, us on Earth. And the reason being is that if in, fine we, if in fact we validate that there is life, no matter how primitive, uh, on another planet like Mars, so incredibly close to our planet, um, that means that basically 
exponentially changes the probability of life in the universe of to being GS is out there we're pretty sure to it's probably everywhere it changes uh, life from a miracle yes. to a statistic yes and yeah. it's probably everywhere and so the question then becomes uh, in our you know years of trying to uh, identify um, advanced life on other planets at least in the uh, in the um, known universe or visible universe which is getting bigger all the time through technology, that we haven't been able to do that. And some have suggested that perhaps that means that there's some sort of filter out there, whatever it might be, uh, whether it be disease, uh, asteroid strikes, uh, uh, you know, any, any number of things that prevents perhaps civilizations from reaching a sophisticated level that allows for interplanetary, fast interplanetary travel and other forms of very, very advanced techniques of communication. Um, so how do you, how do you, what's your reaction to that? Anybody? <laughs> Twyman, what do you think I'm, about that? Let me start with Twyman. Okay, okay start with that. Um, He's young enough to not be yeah, okay, here. Sure. So. Um, well, I, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't really, I, I guess I don't really see it that way. One thing, I mean, the universe is 13.8 billion years old now that we, uh, after hearing the talk yesterday. Um, so it's, I mean, it's a timing, I mean, literally it's a timing thing. I mean, you know. Our solar system was, was formed from the, hydrogen, you know, the gas cloud from a previous supernova that coalesced, created star planets, and then you know, ran off from there. And so not saying you know, that could have happened billions of years previously or, or continue going. Um, I think that's one thing. And then the other thing, you know, 10 years ago, you know, we didn't, I, I, don't, I don't think they identified any exoplanets up until now, and I think we're up until 1500. So, the more we look, the more we're finding stuff. I think we made that assertion because we never really, we'd only looked at the moon and you know, made a little bit of Mars to up till you know, 2000. And now that we've got you know, a, a plutonium sized SUV on, on Mars, we have the uh, Kepler that's looking um, at these exoplanets and everything else. And you know, um, uh, we were talking yesterday, uh, they're sending a, um, uh, an orbiter to Europa, which is a moon of uh, Jupiter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Jupiter, where they think you know there's there's liquid oceans under there. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and the other thing is that I think we think of civilizations we're just going to find other us, you know, that are just you know, they're all, most of them are left-handed instead of right-handed or something like that, you yeah. know. But they're it's going to be very like 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 you were talking about, you know, it's it's going to be microbial. It's going to be you know, for most of this planet, we were single-cell organisms, right? if right. there was life at all. So, Julia, what do you it's think? It's a timing thing. I, is the well. Way I look. I'd like to also dovetail off of what, <clears throat> what Jay said, and that is, you know, we're also equating that life is carbon-based. It doesn't have to be carbon-based. It can be other, element, other types of elements. But as far as the, I think one of the things that we're finding also is that, you know, wonder, <clears throat> you know for a long time, people were like, why haven't we found, found life yet, and so forth? And it, it's like, well, okay, we're not going to find another mini-me of us. But you go looking for planet. it. Yeah. <laughs> But what we are discovering is that the possibility of, you know, some form of life, albeit may not be like us, has definitely gone up from there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. Michelle? Well, I think our biggest mistake is that we assume it's either going to look like us or the little mm -hmm. green men that you go by the little dollop. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I love the movie Contact with Jodie Foster, and I've always lived by the, when people ask her, do you think there's life out there, the answer being, if not, it's an awful big waste of space. And so mm -hmm. I've never liked to think that we were unique and a one-off. I've always liked to think that there's something yeah. else out there, and I just don't think it looks like us, and yeah. I think that's It's also cool. possible, I mean, very possible, people talked about, you know, there's no guarantee that even if there is advanced life out there now that we could communicate with it. They may be yeah. communicating in ways that we simply, our brains simply don't receive. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to tell you something really crazy for the younger people. In the audience. How many of you grew up in the 50s? Okay. I, I grew up in the 50s. Um, and um, I know it's hard for you to believe, but actually in the late 50s and in the you know, late 50s, and, and the, there was actually serious, people didn't know there weren't people on Mars. I mean, there were mm -hmm. movies. I mean, people actually yep. still had that there was life on Mars and what did they look like and, you know, War of the Worlds and all that stuff. You know, it wasn't just entertainment. <laughs> there yeah, were yeah. actually people wondering, are they really there and they getting ready to attack us? So it wasn't... And you talk about the advance of science. It wasn't that long ago that people didn't know. We didn't know that there was absolutely not intelligent life, little green men walking around Mars. Yeah. It, uh, it wasn't until 1964 that this little spaceship called Mariner 4 flew past Mars 
and sent back all these pictures, and, and there was a lot of disappointment there, Chris. And there Chris. wasn't a McDonald's? There, yeah, there was, there was <laughs> nothing, yeah. If you have questions, um, we got, we're going to take some questions, so please go to the mics. Mm. This is your turn now to, to ask any kind of, of questions that you'd like. Um, Just to follow on to that yeah. real quick, Chris, I think one of the, uh, and I actually recommended this book out there, the book that really gave me a lot of that thought was the Ender's Game series. And the fact that they talk about these other civilizations that are nothing at all like mm. the average, what we expect. And I think it's uh, one of the cool things about commercial space in general is we're starting to end, end the newest discoveries, both of them. They're turning our suppositions on their, on their ears, making us think differently. Um, yeah, and talking about, um, you know, talking about um, life in the universe and exomedicine and things like that, let me give you just a really quick, interesting little um, finding. Uh, we're, doing, we're in the middle of a project with Tufts University, Dr. Michael Levin, who's a world-renowned um, regenerative medicine uh, expert, and um, we just flew in January uh, a mission to space station where we took uh, a series of planarian flatworms um, and um, working with Tufts University, we, he, those are, for those of you who don't know, they're a major focus of regenerative medicine because they're basically immortal. If you cut them up, they grow back heads and tails and left to their own forces, they'll basically regenerate. You can kill them, obviously, blunt force, but, but they're really, and so they wanted to understand, um, you know, what happens when you take these, these really amazing um, organisms and suspend them in microgravity, take them out of gravity. So we did that. Uh, Twyman uh, not only became a mechanical engineer, but a biomedical engineer because he had to cut the worms. We actually have an office at Kennedy Space Center, a small office, and also at NASA Ames in California. And at Kennedy, our office is in the Space Life Sciences Center. The reason we're there is because we're about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile from the launch site. So we can do late, what's called late load um, um, for launches. And so the pl uh, planar and flatworks came up. That we, we suspended them for six weeks. They came back. We worked very closely with FedEx. FedEx has a new, actually a vertical in their company called FedEx Space Solutions, which we work very closely with them. And they now handle all, really an amazing system for handling terrestrial movement of space assets up into the point of launch and then return. So we work with SpaceX, uh, I mean SpaceX, FedEx, uh, space solutions to uh, move them back to the lab immediately and they found some really interesting things and one of the things they found which was completely unexpected to show you why you go to space is what they basically cut them into twine and cut them into tails midsections and heads and the tails came back and they had grown heads and the heads came back and they had grown tails uh, midsection grew back and grown heads and tails but one of the midsections had grown two heads um, which is almost, as they, we've told us, is almost never ever seen in nature unless it's chemically induced. Uh, and the other interesting thing is it propagated offspring and the offspring had two heads. Um, so that tells us there was some sort of epigenetic change that happened uh, in space in microgravity that fundamentally changed the structure, the molecular and other kinds of structure of that organism. And I use that just as an example of that's why you go to space. You go to space because you're going to see things that you would never see on Earth. And we believe that some of those things you're going to see are going to be pathways that are going to lead to um, breakthroughs in new kinds of understandings and treatments which will save people's lives and change people's lives. So that's just one. We're getting ready to fly uh, another mission with them very shortly. Um, yes, sir. Uh, identify yourself, please, as well. Uh, Zach Cooper, Murray State University. Uh, with man's entry into space, there arises the unique situation in which a very effective barrier against disease can be set up, such that certain diseases just won't be allowed to go onto a space station. Do you think this could affect the human immune system of those who happen to live in space or off, off of Earth? And um, do you think there exist, would exist the possibility of a, you know, large-scale outbreak that could then devastate an immunally uh, deficient Earth popul or a human population off of Earth? So that's actually a really good question. And one of the things that we found in our astronauts, and not just in our astronauts, but in analogs we've done undersea and in the Arctic, is your immune system is automatically compromised when you're in a stressful situation. Something called viral shedding starts to happen, where you start to shed latent viruses. They show up more in your bloodstream, and uh, it's not necessarily that these viruses will manifest themselves, but they're more likely to, should you come into contact with an active form of that. 
Um, as such, we always put our crews into quarantine for a week or so before they go into space. That's not to say they're in lockdown where they don't get any access to folks, but we do do our best to make sure that we don't bring the common cold even up to the International Space Station. Uh, we did have one instance where a space shuttle crew, somebody flew with cold, got to space station, and everybody was pretty darn miserable because <laughs> under stressful situations, your body is just more immune compromised. And as such, it took the space station crew a lot longer for them to get over that cold. It takes longer for wounds to heal because of that viral shedding. So it is something that we will always have to be very careful of, that when someone's going to go into a space situation where others have been there and they are immune compromised, that they don't bring something with them. Because yes, absolutely, the possibility of wiping out you know, everyone or at least incapacitating them for a long time is a very real problem. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Eric Hahn, Power Creative. Uh, do you think that space exploration is limited terribly by the materials that we currently have on planet and on hand? And do you think there's a relationship basically as, does technology feed off of space exploration or is it the other way around? Like, <laughs> can we colonize Mars with what we have now or does there need to be another great leap forward in the materials we have? Let me answer the first part of your question as far as materials and so forth, and maybe somebody else can answer your other question. Um, but the space industry has been known historically definitely to create items and materials in, in products here on Earth that benefit us. I mean, the Apollo program alone, there's like a, a huge array of, of, of technology that we use today, okay? Um, as far as, uh, but it is a two-way street, okay? There is definitely material development. Material research is just absolutely huge right now um, as far as developing new materials as, and also far as trying to understand our current materials as well. So it, it's, like I said, it's basically a two-way street where they are benefiting both. We're developing materials that can help address radiation uh, exposure to the astronauts. I mean, we cannot shrink wrap the astronauts in gold, you know, to get from here to Mars. You know, that's how, I mean, it, it would help definitely address the radiation aspect, but it's just not a feasible, uh, feasible way to live. But if you want to answer the other part, uh, I'm sorry, we're out of time. Oh, oh. oh. sorry. I know, I know, but we got five minutes to the next session. But let me, I apologize. They're all going to be here. Um, so mm -hmm. please feel free. Jay's going to be signing some books. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got a couple of books out. I know it went fast, and I apologize. Just want to let you know, we take interns. Um, in fact, actually, we're getting ready to, just so you know, we're going to put out a, a note pretty soon to hire a postdoc in exomedicine. Um, and any of you who are interested, um, there's a lot going. All these people um, work with us uh, on Kentucky Space, Space Tango here in Kentucky. Michelle's got a work, couple of workshops coming up, so keep your eye on that. If you're interested in keeping in touch with more of this, send us your email address. We'll put you on our mailing list. Thank you very much.